Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 527, featuring an interview with Stefan Knightsku, uh, the producer of Zoria Age of Shattering from Tiny Trinket Games. I think you'll really be impressed with Stefan. He's got a lot to say about a lot of things. Uh, we talk about crafting systems, player agency, growing up as a gamer in Romania, tactics, stories, party sizes, dealing with negative reviews and criticism, uh, concerns about AI and game development, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Stefan Nightscoot. So it's Stefan. Yeah, but, but we can stick with Stefan. It's I'm okay with that. I'm. It's nice. Uh, I I I'm a lot more accustomed to hearing Stefan when we speak in English than to hear Stefan. So <laughs> it actually sounds weird in in an English phrase, you know. So you're never going by Stefan. Um, in Romania, yeah. In uh, in English, I can't even pronounce it Romanian. I don't know how. If you <laughs> get this. Uh, weird thing it's uh, it's a different pronunciation so yeah it's completely it's completely different but either way is fine do you have uh looks like you've got a zoria do i have that name right zoria zoria okay <laughs> so it looks like you got a zoria t-shirt on there yeah i i, I made this uh for um oh, gamescom last year that was an insane moment it uh it was like we got this opportunity to go to Gamescom and nobody of our like huge team had time to 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 go and I was like it was a one man show that week and I made t-shirts and all that and it was absolutely crazy two days it to to get everything right so uh, might as well use it you know if I have it might as well use it does it have something on the back, or is it just the front? Yeah, uh, this one doesn't, but I have one that does. You got those for sale somewhere? Is it? No, where? Uh, yeah, I. You know, every every game developer hopes that at some point you get there, but apparently we still have a couple of steps to climb until we get there. Yeah, I'm talking uh, to a lot of developers, and they they always say, "Don't do the shirts, or don't do hats, don't do any physical." merge because it's so exp it's way more expensive than you'd think yeah it, it, this is custom this is like i made it for myself like i went and bought the right size shirts and then i went to a shop and had them printed but yeah it make it it's not it's not a money thing it's just uh yeah. it just makes you feel good you know yeah, you you participated cool. in something that it's on a t-shirt. I'm a bit of a collector, you know, of uh, like old consoles and stuff like that. You can see a few of the Teenage uh, Mutant Ninja Turtles part in the background. So, uh, yeah, it it's something when you get to be part of the culture, you know, a bit. Since we... Uh, a small part of what we grew up, we grew up like outside of it. I, I'm born in 81. So I, uh, uh, a sizable part of my childhood I spent on the other side of the fence. So uh, you, we, we started like a long way from uh, from the the culture, and then slowly got closer. And now we we got here, and it's it's a it's a great feeling. So yeah, that's why I I came with the shirt. Uh -huh. If you got an extra one, I'll take it. Ah, oh, with with pleasure, <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, extra I'm one, I don't, but I'm I'm gonna next. make a few. Awesome. Well, Stefan, Zoria, Age of Shattering, kick-ass game. I've been playing it uh, quite a lot. Oh. And I had a lot of requests. People were telling me about this match. You've got to get these guys on the show. Holy cow! Have you seen this game? <laughs> well i hope i hope they like it i don't know uh i was i was just looking at the reviews i'm 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 fighting with the i'm fighting with oh the, no you looked at the uh, reviews are they bad uh they're not bad they're actually quite good and i've seen like a lot of ugly things happening lately 
uh with um with uh, some really good games and they've had um probably worse review than they deserve but you know every time there's a negative review that comes you always look like could we have done this better could we have done that better and well when there's systems things you know it's and it's it that when there's like a negative one at the top yeah yeah it it, it always is oh. I, let me tell you that it always is a negative one up there just, and you oh, always I, I disagree with this and oh. here this is what I, I disagree <laughs> with a lot of them but it's like, their I mean, like, like five hours for god's sake it's their worthy opinion i mean uh some of them yeah uh, others, I look throughout through the reviews, and I'm like, well, probably we didn't really explain correctly what the game was about, or probably the expectations were a bit different from what we wanted. But regardless, it's uh, it's just um, you you can't ignore them. I don't know. I would. <laughs> I was kind of brace for impact when I'm looking at reviews and comments, but you know, yeah, I agree. You look at it if it's, if they make a good point, you know, you could say, well, maybe for the next game we'll factor that in. But well, actually, if they're just trashing it. I mean, what's the value? Well, in the in the end, you know, in the end, I I look at it like this. I look at the review. Okay, it's refunded. It's refunded. Excellent, excellent choice. Uh, if it's not refunded and it's a uh, it's a negative review, okay. But in the end, it's his money, his his entitled an opinion. But it's still, you know, each one of them hits a bit. So when and it it's it's a very weird thing. You get like five, six, seven, ten positive reviews, yeah. and you're you have a good week. You get two, three, four negative ones in a row, and the whole week goes to oh, no, exactly. like it's it's done. And uh, I I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we honestly had a lot of fun making it. Uh, yeah, maybe we should back up a little bit. So just for folks that are just now hearing about this game, <laughs> can you kind of introduce what it is and, and well, uh, what the plan was and. A little bit of the background. Uh, oh, it, I, I'm gonna touch on what the plan was, but uh, we would probably need to switch from an elevator of people to a floor of people to obtain what we initially wanted. <laughs> because, as I said, there, there's three guys making the game. This is the whole team, so we wanted to do a lot of things. We pretty confident we succeeded on quite a few of them, but sure. There's something still, uh, still not where we would have wanted it to be. Well, it's an RPG. Let's let's start with that. It's a classic RPG. It's a um, third-person squad-based. Uh, what we did a bit, uh, what we wanted. There, there are a few pillars that we wanted to touch up on uh, in the design, and. As much as I, I'm trying to avoid this, I'm going to be a bit marketing-ish because the presentation part, I had to do a bit. Um, what we wanted to do first uh, and foremost regards combat. Uh, we wanted to be, you know, somewhere in the middle between the very slow, very tactical RPGs where, okay, they're like very deep tactical combat but at the same time every time you see an enemy or a set of enemies you're like oh boy this is gonna take 30 minutes of my life and if i screw it up it's gonna take another 30 minutes of my time and we wanted story to be <laughs> sorry i'm that's a story of my life in like two minutes but go ahead <laughs> yeah and we wanted to be somewhere in the middle between you know that that tactical depth and the uh, the ease of 
playing games like Diablo, for example, you know, which would be, I'm using big titles because I'm sure they hammer up an image in everyone's head. So we were like, okay, we stick with turn-based, but what is the smoothest turn-based experience you can have without, (coughs) without the experience being boring, being downright boring, like you because okay you can make a very smooth turn based game if you have three abilities and then uh and then you put it on mobile and because that's where it belongs so we had to do a bit of balancing on that one but we this is what we try to do in combat we try to make a, a turn based combat that feels smooth that feels um that takes a bit less time like you have a 5 to 10 minutes fight if it's a like a more meaty fight or a under one minute fight if it's like some if there's some uh mobs like simple enemies nothing fancy uh this is this is what we try to do with combat this is the reason uh there is synergy between classes but there's not uh, uh there's not em- there's no environmental effects so you don't get that depth of uh, you put some oil and you set it on fire and then there's rain and there's no more fire and because that that no, I besides never the like I never like those mechanics. <laughs> well, like... they 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 have something of you know real life. There, there's some fun in it, but at the same time, be, beyond the technical complexity, which is like a lot. And I know one guy from our team who would have like killed us if we said let's do that (laughs) he's had a lot of work as it is but beyond that um they're fun when they're you know they're fun when they happen but the problem is the first time they happen the second time you start looking for it "Mm, do i have barrels do i have uh and yeah, and that makes you know and then you have battle preparation which we like cut out completely we get a lot of like uh, we get a lot of um, negative feedback let's call it like that on the fact that hey i i stumbled in combat and my guys were not perfectly positioned what do i do now well roll with it but <laughs> the point w- what we try to do is take out uh, combat preparation take out complex mechanics keep give it depth but at the same time don't give it that staggered feeling of you know and, and now i do this and and now i have to do that and now i have to set them up and and there's and what are am i fighting two spiders do i really have to do positioning for that okay there's gonna sure there's gonna be two three encounters when you're gonna really miss positioning but there's 200 more where you don't. So that's the... the... realistic. I mean, I played those games where you, you have a stage where you set up all your characters, and I'm like, how realistic is that? <laughs> when well, would that it, happen in real life? I mean, Depending on context, I'm a big fan of the XCOM series. Uh, it okay. doesn't... Like, from the very, very ms-dos first xcom games and in some of those because i've played each and every one of them even the really bad ones uh and in some of them you had this you know pre uh, preparation stage okay in that context makes sense if you're a commando and you want to like storm because uh, it's jagged alliance number three that came up i haven't seen uh, I've haven't heard of that game like for ages, and that's a kind of context where it makes sense yeah, to okay. to to have. But here it kind of doesn't, and I like this effect of you know you you move and something happens on you, but you're you're moving, you're marching, you're supposed to not be in the perfect position, formation formations because we have the formation system. They're like that's the intent but it's never perfect it's uh, we we did away with grid because you you make this grid and everything gets more rigid and we don't have grid we don't have preparation stage so yeah it's not going to be perfect every time but i kind of like it like that you know it's 
bit more fluid. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with this 100% on that because it's part of a strategy or, or tactics too, right? Well, I've got this, it's not an optimal situation. Now, what do I do? You know, and I was thing. just, I was just reading a, a comment because I read every forum post, I read every Discord post, I yeah. answer like most of them. And actually, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm enjoying this. So oh. I'm, uh, I, I'm really oh happy God, to do it. <laughs> but there was there was a, a guy that said, "Look, did you guys?" Are you guys doing the same I do? I'm setting up my formations in reverse. So when I see an enemy, I run. And because the formation is set in reverse, um, he puts the tank in the back or the tanks in the back. So he sees the enemy, he runs, the enemy picks up. And when they enter combat, uh, <laughs> the tanks are in the front because he was running away. And that's how he's using formations. And I was like, that's what I wanted to to achieve. Uh, you can play with that. You can play with the system. You can use it. Maybe it's not the intended use, but I like it for a game to not go with the intended use. Yeah, there's a word uh, for emergent gameplay. I think they call that when the. I I, I I have no honest honestly I I don't know I I can't really when tell a player you comes up with some players might come yeah. up with a strategy or something and you're like wow I never thought somebody would do that that's cool there's a lot of things players did that we never thought they would do like a lot of things <laughs> but I'm happy they're doing it I mean if they're doing it it, it means they're like taking like we, we said the game is going it's 20 hours long that's what we said. And their players right? are playing 40 to 60 hours, so we kind of might have missed the mark on that one a bit. Um, but if they're doing that, I'm really happy they're doing that. It means they're enjoying it, and yeah, in the end, that's what you want from a game. So that I was like, uh, we we veered off course. I tend to do a, that a lot, so I'm... You're more than welcome to like steer the the ship in the right direction if I <laughs> um, uh, go, of course, too much. But um, that was the combat design. Um, we wanted the world to be varied, you know, like in in the old games, like the really old games, like the, even the old platformers in. Back in the MS DOS era, um, there was always this feeling you get where I really gotta finish this level up because I'm really curious how the next one looks. Yeah. The, that feeling that you are curious to see the, the next level and uh, see what they came up with and see how it looked and it, it, the next world. And we wanted to do a bit of that. And um, one of the things that was actually done quite late in the game was the lake. You know, in the main area, there's the lake. And because we had this big dungeon, this the, the manor, and it initially was like dead center in the, in the um, map. And I was like, what if we create this little... This little world, the the lake town, the town, it's the, like a fishing, half a fishing village, but uh, create this whole uh, manor on the island idea just because it it gives you a feeling of a new place. And it it definitely you can you can add a bit of like mystery and some interesting quests and some interesting. So that's the 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 core design of the the environment and then we wanted to to have the whole base and management uh, the base management system you 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 have like sure. 60 plus followers <laughs> you uh sorry so i love that yeah uh you yeah, you like, can feel a bit of I got like 15 people that are camping out in my keep <laughs> yeah and it's it's gonna keep going up and up. 
that's uh you can feel a bit of XCOM there, you know, the that idea of managing uh something between an army and the commando, somewhere in you you have like your own small army and you can switch between them anytime you want. Uh you don't really have to, you know, stick with because there's like a lot of RPGs and I I some of them like are exceptionally good. We're not giving names, but we all know what we're talking about. <laughs> in in this uh, era, I we we had our fair share of uh, well, you know, it's not Baldur's Gate three. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's a a, a, a bit of, uh, you probably of get balance. Like Sorry, the, you probably get people comparing this to Divinity Original yeah. Sin and yeah, uh, you know, Baldur's Gate three. To me, it's, it feels the most like we've already mentioned Diablo. You know, I was thinking if somebody made Diablo, if they had made Diablo turn based, you know, with a squad, that's yeah. what it felt like to me. Uh, it's a lot of a uh, big influence, not on my side, but on the other Stefan's side, because there's two Stefans in the team. And, uh, and uh, he was a big fan of Diablo. Um, Probably a bit of war, World of Warcraft in it. We maybe, yeah. We wasted like two years of our lives in that. So <laughs> <Wasted. laughs> definitely, yeah. Well, at, at some point, uh, it's a magnificent game. Recent. But like all, like all MMOs, at some point, it's you know, it can get a bit unhealthy. Okay. <laughs> it's done seriously enough. It can get the ability to distinguish the game from reality. You know, some some level like that. Yeah, you know, I was thinking and this your game has suffers the most, uh, complicated. Well, I shouldn't say complicated. Uh, what's the? There's a positive way to say that. Complex. Uh, yeah, complex uh, crafting system. I've seen. You know, I like to make armor and weapons and, you know, all of those items. And you've got like this, I was trying to find a picture of it, but you've got like seven or five or six like elements you can plug into each piece of armor. <laughs> I mean, wow. You know, the same thing with uh, the alchemy. Uh, it's really nice. And, it, you know, I, I think it's fun. I was trying to, I need to find a picture of the, of the Overland map too. Uh, but I just like going around and finding, oh, there's some herbs. <laughs> there's some crystals. Uh, there's some metals. Like, oh, what can I do with this? You know, it's uh, you know, I love that. Well, what we try to do, thank you. What we try to do um, with, I, I, I'm not really a big fan of you know. Here's the recipe. Here's the materials. Do it. Hmm. The, there's no player agency in that. Of course, with the um, the cooking and the alchemy, in the end, we we stuck with that system because uh, we didn't want to overcomplicate things. But generally, when you you have just a recipe and the materials to get, mm -hmm. there's no real player agency. The player does nothing. He's just an uh, uh, a postman. You know, he goes he picks up herbs he comes back and he makes the whatever it is and we that's why with crafting we went with this idea let's okay you have the blueprint the blueprint says three stones but let the player choose which stones so he's got the blueprint he's got the base stats but beyond the base stats let him fine tune what he wants in the item because otherwise, the whole crafting mechanic is just uh, uh, in game design wise. If you don't do anything like to involve the player in creating and doing it, you're just using it as a way to um, give the player busy work. You you just have to find the red stone of boredomness in the high <laughs> slopes of. Let's go run. kill now go kill 50 mobs and get that and okay it it's got a place in in design but then just make it a quest 
it, it it doesn't have to have the crafting screen and everything. Make it a quest, give him the armor in the end. If you have a fixed recipe, because he's got nothing to do in a fixed recipe. There's nothing for the player to do. He just has to get the materials, put them in, click craft. So you can just take out the whole crafting system, make that a quest, the place he goes for the materials, make it a quest, give him the armor is the same thing. You don't need a mechanic. You can completely take it out of the game. If you don't give the player his ability to put his mark on what he crafts, because that's when you're a craftsman, when you craft something with your mark on it, which is, of course, I, you can't do that with the how the hilt looks or the 3D image or anything like that, but you can do it with, okay, do you want this to be more like um, defensive stats? armor or more like uh, resistances or more like base stats something you 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 get this agency in in the system i think it's a brilliant system it makes it a lot more interesting too i think it's sid meyer i hope it's sid meyer that says a game is a series of interesting decisions or something like that now i was thinking you've really made crafting like that because a lot of the times i'm making some maybe i'm making a piece of armor for my tank let's say and i'm thinking <laughs> well i've got this really good recipe and I've got some really cool stones. This one's like super rare. I got like a rare gem, you know, things. Do I want to put that in this piece of armor or wait, you know, until later, you know? And so I'm always like, yeah. waiting. maybe I don't have very good, you know, this one ingredient might kind of suck. And I'm like, well, maybe I should wait until I get a better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We, I mean, we, it's really uh, involved. I mean, it, it's so involved. Thank you. Uh, that's a good thing. <laughs> For us too, because that's when we designed it like that. There was another idea behind this with the crafting, with the you know switching around between um, between characters, and you can do that like a hundred times during your playtime. Um, what the idea was, you know, because and it links to combat in a very weird way. It does because. If you have like the the you know very few loot items like many games do, and the fixed party, and let's say crafting it's like recipe based, you get a recipe as I do, then all of your decision space, the space where the player makes the decisions, it's mostly moved into the combat. So most 90% of the decisions you make are in the fighting space. If you start and piecing all these pieces, you take them out one by one and you move the, uh, you give him team decision that he can, like, it's not a choice. Do I take this or that guy? It's a choice he can make over and over and over again. And then uh, crafting, you make one item and you don't like it. And then you make another one. And then you you can do that a lot of times and you can fine tune what you do. And all of these decisions, if you move them out of the combat space, you give him tactical decisions to the player way before he enters combat, then you can smooth out the combat. Because the combat is no longer the place where all the decisions happen. It's just the place where all your previous decisions come into play. That was the like the philosophic philosophy behind behind the the design we we did for the game. Yeah, it's just it's just I really like the system. I you'd mentioned World of Warcraft and I'm thinking that's the I've done some crafting in that as well. And I think it would feel very limiting, <laughs> like moving from Zoria to back to you know World of Warcraft, and it, it, like, oh my God, it's got a different even, purpose. Can't even call that a crafting system anymore. I feel like you've spoiled me. <laughs> uh, I'm I, I'm really glad you you liked it. Uh, we we loved it a lot, and actually the, we there's would have been a bit more layer of depth into the alchemy system, also. But uh, we, yeah, it was the all the systems. There's already a lot of complexity in the game, and mm -hmm. like a 
many players like feel it's too much complexity. It, it comes from the old old days, the old school style of gaming where there were lots and lots of you don't systems. Have to use the crafting system, right? Couldn't you just find items and buy stuff? Yeah. And have yeah. To? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was that was one of the things we wanted to do with many of the systems. It's you don't really have to use them. I mean, crafting, yeah, it's going to give you some excellent items, mm. but you're going to find almost as good items without crafting. The same with the missions, because I don't know if you, you uh, played a bit of the mission system. Um, the, the idea behind the system was pretty simple. Look, I gave you 50 guys and you tend to go with four, five, six because you like them and they get to level 15 and the rest of your team is like level five mm -hmm. and you have a problem there because all the, the our design of allowing you to switch between them doesn't work anymore because you're not going to take the level five guys. It, it makes no sense. So we introduced this system just so you can Level up the part of the team that you don't take with you. You keep at the same level as um, the the guys that you take with you. And at the same time, you get some resources. Mm. Again, an optional system. You can play with it a lot or you can ignore it completely. You can play this game like, look, I have a team of four. This, this is what I like. I'm going with this team. I'm going to pick up whatever I find along the way. I'm not going to craft. I'm not going to do missions. I'm not going to do anything. And you can finish the game. And that's the idea, to 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 not limit the player in any, like, remarkable way. Uh, even the, the um, environment um systems you know because each class has like a different environment ability and that and this was a, like a mixed it was received with a mixed feeling the system uh because on the one hand it was fun on the other hand it, it was like but i'm gonna need a wizard here but i'm gonna need a lancer here but i'm gonna need yes but the you don't really have to see all the the nooks and crannies. If you want to see all the nooks and crannies, yes, you're gonna you're gonna need everyone. But other than that, you can ignore it. I'm a definitely a nooks and cranny guy. <laughs> like uh, I've got to see everything if I possibly can. We are, of course, because we we designed it like that. But I I'm trying, and we try to um, give like equal opportunity to different kind of players. And we had like a long conversation between some of our players on Discord uh, when some were like, because two classes, the Bard and the Necromancer, honestly, lore-wise, story-wise, made absolutely no sense to have a starting class. You don't have a former... Uh, um, a Citadel Commander that's a bard it doesn't work and at the same time you're fighting you're the good guys and you're fighting with the bad guys because they're using necromancy and you can't have your former commander to be a necromancer it doesn't work and th there was this long conversation when we said look we're gonna do it like this we're gonna unlock these two classes because everyone asked if we could unlock these two classes as commander class as the the main character but we're gonna put in a disclaimer look it's not meant to be played like this from a story perspective from a lore perspective but if you want to play it from a gameplay perspective okay we're opening it up so we're trying to let Everyone take what they like from the game without like telling them no you you should play like this or you should play like that. Well, that that's the philosophy of the how we design. I, I think that's the way every designer should feel, right? It's just I want to make the player happy. You know, if the players want to do it this way, if there's no I would rather them do this, but you know, I'm not the player. <laughs> if they want Exactly. That's, that's the correct attitude to have, you know. I, 
you know, sometimes I find people that they'll get, they love some part of their game so much that they feel like every player must, you know, do it that way. And, you know, if some, sometimes it just doesn't really work out, you know, <laughs> not every player is the same. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And in the end, uh, and we had a lot of these heated conversations, like a lot of them, but in the end, every time you get back to, to that point where you say, wait a minute, we did this as players since we were children. Why did we play those games? Because they let us do sometimes fun things, sometimes stupid things, sometimes they annoyed us for three days until we passed a certain level, but they let us do it. Uh, it's not a movie. Uh, if it's a movie, let's just make a movie. Uh, it's not a movie because the player can do things. Okay, let's do things. And we didn't have like quick travel because I don't know. It, I didn't. We didn't feel it was necessary. And after launch, because we we released about seven patches so far, seven or eight. Um, and the players were like. Mm, yeah, but this is annoying because there's some areas that I have to go back and forth. Okay, we've put in some fast travel. No problem with that. Sure, a couple of them unlock a bit later because I, I want you to see that place at least once to, to see waste it. Waste stones you're talking about? Uh, the? Sorry? The waste no. stones? No, no, not the waste stones. The, um, it's like a horse the, guy. The horse guy. It wasn't there. It it's there since 104 or since 105. Oh. It it wasn't there from the at launch the 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 horse guy wasn't there. No, the waystones are part of the deeper story, you know, the post post apocalyptic setting. Because there's two kinds of games, you know, there's the medieval and then there's the uh, post apocalyptic, you, you know, you have Bethesda and they, they say look it's like um, Elder Scrolls this way and Fallout this way. And I'm like, what if we put Elder Scrolls after Fallout? What happens then? Mm. And we got to, to where we are in the in the story, with the story. What if you put Elder Scrolls after Fallout? <laughs> well, wow, uh, that's a thought. Uh, this wow. is it. That's amazing. I don't. I wouldn't want to do the fast travel anyway, because then I'd miss out on all the herbs and stuff and the, <laughs> the little deer. I, I find myself yeah. a deer. I'm like every time it's just, there's a deer, <laughs> I have to click on it. It gets. I don't know. I probably got like way too too many uh, deer meat, <laughs> point, but I don't. <laughs> I don't care. It's it's fun. And we talked a little bit already, I guess, about the influence of the game. Uh, it's, so I had a question here. It's a science it's fiction and. Uh, they were wanting to know about Ender's Game. Yeah, Ender's Game. Uh, Jeez, what's the? Why am I blanking on the author of that? Um, uh, Ors Orson Orson Scott Card Orson Scott Card. I I I I you know I I would rather just say the the part of the name that I can pronounce correctly and stick with. That. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and it's been a game. long time since I read that. I think I read uh, that. Uh, a good story. Me too. But uh, uh, yeah, that that would be, that would make for a like a insanely fun experimental game. But experimental, you know, I I of all the the science fiction I went through, uh, Ender's Game. It like half of the game happens inside the the inside the the head i but i would like totally want to see um a sierra game of the next three books in the series of the speaker for the dead or uh Xeno, xenocide i suppose i i read them in romanian so sorry uh <laughs> I, I i absolutely don't know the titles in in original I, I read them. Are there? I've only read the first one. Are the other ones good? Uh, it's completely different. I mean, the um, those would make 
uh, there's some really nice world building, like some really taking a lot of concepts and twisting them around and taking um, taking some cues from the uh, the weird part of nature, you know, and make uh, xenocide. Yeah, I suppose it's xenocide. But the 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 whole series, it's the same. Yeah, uh, um, like a hundred bucks in this. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is no. I didn't go that deep. Oh, but the the Ender series, it's the first four books. Yeah, I've read they're it. the first. Ender's and Speaker for the Dead and Xenoxide and Children. Actually, uh, looking at. AI today and uh, remembering some things I read in those books, uh, it gets me a little uneasy, but <laughs> hopefully we don't get to the, to that phase of uh, of humanity. But honestly, uh, those would make for a fun Sierra, Sierra game, you know, the old um, quest King's style games. King's Quest. Uh, yeah, that that would uh, those would make for a uh, for an interesting game because those games used to uh, they didn't have a lot of mechanics because they couldn't because the computers would burn if you try to do too much with them back then. And actually, I think I still have a four eight six functional. I didn't really test it out. Yeah, uh, never mind. Um, so. But what they did was they gave you ideas and they they opened your mind back then with all sorts of crazy, wonderful worlds, with all sorts of um, weird things, weird systems, weird ideas, uh, weird, I don't know, the science fiction's one with weird creatures and the fantastic worlds and yeah, that those would make an uh, uh, for a good uh, for a good game. Uh, the the more... yes we're <laughs> we're in that territory yeah. and uh, if you go through the books yeah they they're they're worth uh, they're worth uh, a game like that but i don't know because you said the influences i don't know we've been playing games since i actually i have been playing games first on what was back then the an eastern european copy of zx spectrum so what was that called um hc was called in romanian i i don't know if you're gonna find that i hc family yeah east european this is new to me wow well, there's like a Romanian version, a Czech version, a Polish version, a Rush, oh, like five version. Russian versions. Yeah, th this is the 85 one. This is I the 85 one, the oldest. But uh, if you look at the 1991 ones, they're, they look a little bit more technological. But boy, th those were like, like some really bad machines. But we started playing on those. So um, actually... Uh, if you ask me what what influences, I'm gonna tell you ten games. I'm I'm gonna forget fifty because you played a lot of games. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what. <laughs> that, that it was. You know, it really wasn't a lot to do in 1990s Romania. Like there really wasn't a lot to do. So. Yeah, we played games. The the lucky ones that managed to have some any sort of computer because they were like the same price. They were imported, so they were the same price they were uh, everywhere else. Uh, yeah, we played a lot of games. That's what we did. That's cool. That's how we ended up here. Some of us. Yeah, I don't think you played. Or I got a note here about Dungeons and Dungeons and Dragons was not a thing. Or no. no so no, we we uh, it wasn't popular because uh look early 1990s um we there was it was like the absolute wild west i mean we we found out what pirated games were were 
when we figured out the only kind of games that were being sold in Romania were pirated and they were like being sold oh. out on the street. No but, uh, copies. Yeah, if I remember correctly, we didn't actually have a, a copyright law. So there were like kind of legal because there was no law against them. It was like the complete Wild West back then. And our first contact was with video games. There was no, no such thing as board games. Th yeah, there were some like really bad copies of, uh, but nobody bothered with them. There were like horrible thing because, uh, you know, um, a video game, it's a video game. You copy it in the end, it's, a, it's the same video game. But if you try to make a copy of a um, tabletop game, and you have like really bad technology and really bad cardboard and really bad everything, it's going to be a really bad copy of that game and nobody's going to want to touch it. And yeah, by the time like actual proper games were coming, I was I was probably 25 years old or something like that or way past. Uh, so no, we didn't. And be, be beyond the fact that well dungeons and dragons it's um uh, at the base it's not really a tabletop game it's uh, how do you call it um the tabletop part just helps you in a way but some people yeah i mean some people play it with a lot of miniatures and things and but other people yeah yeah uh, spoken it's just pretty much uh, words <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I it, it like a, like a, a theater of the mind, I think is what they call it. I, yeah, yeah. But the just, problem was <sighs> there was no avenue for information. So we we found out what Dungeons and Dragons was through video games. Hmm. We we never heard of it before video games. So yeah, you know, that's yeah. the same. I mean, I'd heard of it, of course, growing up and the u.s but i never played it you know well i played it much later i was playing games like uh, yeah Baldur's gate uh the gold box pool of radiance you know that was my introduction to it no we i i i can't really say what our introduction and our realization that the video game is based on something if you ask me back then, if you showed me Dungeons and Dragons back then, I'd say, hey, that's based on the video game I play. <laughs> because, I mean, again... Really I never thought about how the... I know about piracy, but I never really thought about how the board games weren't really prone to piracy, right? Because like you say, it's too hard well, to build a... You'd have to pretty much have your own sort of whole industry i guess to make it everything is prone to piracy but with a disc you that, just copy the disc you copy the tape <laughs> yeah, so. it's a it's completely different and it allowed for the uh culture to um to be imported much faster um because i'm uh uh, this is going to be an anecdote, but uh, since we touched that subject, I think it's relevant as a piece of information. Um, back in the 1980s, late 1980s, before the the um, Iron Curtain fell, it was like insanely hard to get your hands on a video recorder because nobody, it was not allowed and it was insanely expensive. But the fun part was getting the tapes because there were like a, a million weird ways. And one of the weird ways I know of was like the pilots doing, you know, um, the few flights to the Western side. They were like going to the shops and renting a tape and uh, coming back, copying it a hundred times and then uh, bring it back next week. And none of the, you know, the owners of the, rental the video uh, rental shops would have thought their their tape flew across the ocean twice and got copied like a thousand times somewhere beyond <laughs> beyond the iron curtain they would have never thought of that one 
but it happened. So yeah, th- th- those were like really wild, uh, wild times. But what they allowed, they allowed us to to connect with the culture much faster, mm. because uh, like as I said, proper, um, correct way to do it. It's something like after the nineties. The nineties were completely wild. Ah, what a different world it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very different, but we're happy to be here. You know, slowly the islands got closer and here we are. I'm kind of curious now thinking about this. Was Is Magic the Gathering a big thing there? It is a thing. It's not a big thing, but it is a thing. It's, it got here about the same way. Uh, I guess you call it, call them proxies. That's what everybody started on, and then the the shops started appearing, and then started bringing Magic the Gathering. Actually, I have a friend that is a really good Magic the Gathering player in our local context. Context, but yeah, yeah. Now, now it's a thing. It's not such a big thing. It it uh, you you don't have the size. You don't have the cultural background to have like this much power in the in uh in a cultural phenomenon like this but it's slowly becoming a thing and i'm really happy f- uh, that it's happening until you get addicted to it and then start buying cards <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> but, uh... it, it, it's a side effect i uh, as i said we experienced it with world of warcraft so I say a lot of people say I'm addicted to this, like it's a bad thing. But I always just say, well, that just means you really enjoy it. You know, you're having fun with this. Yes, yes. There's a lot worse things you could be addicted to. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long list, and we're also importing some of those slowly. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I got it. Got a couple of the questions about this. Absolutely. Uh, Oh, chess. So how does chess? I've been thinking about this one too. So how does chess influence a squad-based tactical RPG like Zoria? Well, look, I I think they're, in my opinion, because again, uh, the more opinions, the better, but uh, the way I see it, it's it kind of shouldn't because chess, it's a closed game. It's a, it's a closed balance. And it's it it's really good at developing you know tactical mind and yeah it it influences it like that but as you you can see we ran away from chess we we did away with the grid we ran away from chess we didn't run towards it um but at the same time one of the like really because we we touched we touched on that a bit earlier with the um with the new levels and new worlds and how everything is designed um one of the really nice things you can do with video games it's have um add new things and surprise the player and this is an open system the the even if it's squad based even if it's super tactical even it's a it's an open system. You can always come with new abilities, with new classes. You, even the the base design of the game, it's you go with your squad, you uh, meet a really nasty guy that is resistant to light magic. You have three team members that have mainly light magic damage, and then you go back. You switch around and you try again with a better team suited for that guy. So the core design is the openness of the system versus a uh, chess that it's uh, it lasted for a few thousand years. So the guys that made it were pretty smart at making a balanced system. I'm 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 guessing that, but. It's still a closed system. It's th- one of the core designs is you have to do with what you have on the board. That's it. Nothing to be added. 
And the beauty of these games is that you have the openness and then you can come, I can come with a patch and give you a new class and it's going to make the game interesting in a different way. So openness of versus closed system, I think they're uh, they're both tactical, but that's the the um, the extent of the overlap, honestly, in my in my view. Well said. Well, I got a couple of questions here about the gameplay mechanics. Yeah, I'm not the super number one on uh, on yes. this part because I I'm not uh, the one in charge of the um of the combat system i was more in a bit more in charge of the story lore actions interactions stuff like that but i'm pretty on on i should be pretty on team with it now these are just i think relatively quick questions i bet you have an opinion on them <laughs> uh, the one is just what do you think about permadeath in a game or in a squad-based game. Do you enjoy a permadeath mode where your character dies for good? Me? No. I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, yes. That sucks. It's, <laughs> look, it, it's got its place. Uh, it's got its place, but its place is on a difficulty slider. That's where it, it belongs. There you go. On a difficulty slider. As far as I'm concerned, I there's moments and moments. Sure, I enjoy a challenge from time to time, but I also want to. Uh, I enjoy a story more than a challenge. And if you put the story behind the challenge, we're not really very good friends because you're taking the story away from me until I get good at the challenge. And I don't like that. I I understand its place, and I'm I like I really admire the guys that can do this. And the, they're like, oh, you know, this really super hard game. Yeah, it's missing something that makes it insanely really super hard. And I okay, if if that's your thing, awesome. That's what I like about video games in general. You can find something for everyone. But as far as I'm concerned, if you put the story behind the challenge. You're just taking the story away from me. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's to me, it would be if you play the game once and then maybe you want to replay it. And since you know it better now, you know, you might want to ratchet up the difficulty. Yeah, you know, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, but yeah, I <laughs> don't you. I usually get a little, I hate to say it because I guess I'm, you know, I've played so many CRPGs, I should really like the super difficult ones. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like it, to go with like a normal mode. Uh, it's usually, it's like easy or story mode. Then you have like normal and you know Iron Man and, mode or something. And you know, I'm not, and I'm not like, the Iron Man mode. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm totally not the Iron Man mode. And again, I like the idea of giving the being able to give the player this possibility. But let's call it a possibility. It made sense in the 90s. It made sense in the late 80s, early 90s. It totally made sense. You had like those, you know, cartridges and you had like very limited memory and you had, okay, I can make eight worlds. If the game is easy, he's going to finish it in five hours and then he's going to ask why it's, it's so expensive. Let's let's make it harder. It was a design choice. It made sense. We're not there yet. The player should be able to to go through it however he pleases. So I'm not a fan. No, personally, totally not well, a fan you, of Permadeath. You said you wanted this game to be about 20 hours, yeah. you know, from start to finish. I'd hate to see it, you know, if you're like, well, we could get, I mean, we could make this 40 hours or 100 hours if we just make the combat so difficult. Yeah, yeah. Like, they, it but time. no, actually, actually, we, we managed to make it uh, a bit longer than that just because there were a lot of things we want to do and a lot of like little stories we want to tell and the make let's put this and let's make that and i and again it's a lot smaller than we <laughs> than the first design let's uh, let's say it like that but not this is this is busy work as far as i'm concerned and i try to we all of us try to avoid 
the busy work as much as possible. Making the player, you know, waste time to make the game look bigger. There's no there's no quality anymore in big games. There was a quality in big games in the 90s when you switched from the very short games and you could at some point make a lot of game because mm. the hardware changed and a lot of... Yeah, there was a quality to it. Right now, people have lives and there's a lot of interesting things happening. There's a lot of good books. There's a lot of good movies. You don't necessarily have to like have 100 hours to make a worthy game. It just happened to be bigger than we wanted. It, 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 it's not necessarily a quality always. Well, it's, I mean, it's a good value compared to any other medium. You know, 20, 20 hours. Yeah, 20 yeah, hours. yeah, yeah. But you go to a movie, it's what maybe three hours if it's a super long movie. Yes, yeah, uh, so it's a. It's it's always been gaming. It's always been like if you look at it financially, it's always felt like a good value. Do you have a combination of classes? I'm talking about Zoria, do you have a combination of classes that you recommend for a new player? Honestly, no. And even if I really did have, I wouldn't say. Uh, and <laughs> I'm gonna I tell like you why. That. I really I like. like sorry, I, I'm. I'm. It's breaking up a no, 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 little. Bit. I have like a Kingsman and a Lancer and a Wizard and a not the battle. What's the name of the other cleric battle cleric or priest priest yes that's my combo <laughs> actually i i, I like, like the the battle cleric a bit yeah it's very powerful i might have to go back and try the battle cleric some more but i why well, i wouldn't say anything even if i had like my sweet party it's because the idea of the game is to switch them around the the core design is of course you can have a party from start to finish and it's gonna work but the the idea behind it is to experiment with them mm -hmm. that's why you have two or three of each so you can have like two wizards with two completely different builds and you can always respect them and it's free Mm -hmm. Just because the the what what we wanted to open was this door to play around, find what you like about it. Uh, uh, we we had a playtest at one point, and uh, Gabby, which is the the code wizard in the in our party, um, somehow ended up with a full healing party, and boy, that was the longest playtest we had for a dungeon it went on for something like three hours and he, he did not die but uh <laughs> it took a long time to. <laughs> but i said okay does it work well it works in a way it works which is there's excellent. always that guy and i was like four bards you know <laughs> okay see. Let's see what happens. I I I I'd love to see a a, a, a playthrough of that, but not bards because you don't really have four bards in the in the game. But it'd anything be else? Be a little challenging. Uh, yeah, but I think it's good. It has a lot of variety too. Because if you do get kind of bored with combat, just switch out some, get some different classes in there. You know, and then you get all these new abilities and stuff. And beyond bard, I'm make pretty and armor for him. Beyond Bard, I'm pretty sure you can do a four, a party of four for each class, except the Bard. <clears throat> I was wondering how you settled on four. Was there some discussion about how many characters you should have in the party? Uh, that, 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 <laughs> that was a heated a, discussion. <laughs> no, that was a really weird one that happened for a complete completely unrelated reason and then we fixed the reason but we stuck up with four because we got to a point where we decided well it it's really good for but the initial reason was um at some points in the game you get an extra character okay. so you get five but only for specific story purposes so if we went with um if we went with five, then at specific story moments, it would have been six. 
And whatever we did, uh, Six would break the UI layout into pieces. So we had a UI issue and it's like, there's gonna be no moment in this game there's six characters in your party because everything is gonna break up. And then we said, okay, so we can't have five. And then we test played with four and with five. And if you have five characters, some combats have to be more difficult. Other combats, uh, you have to make the enemies different and you get like this inflation of everything. And it doesn't necessarily make it more fun because you have five, then an encounter with three is going to be an encounter with four, let's say. So you get more turns, so you get more interactions so the combat is longer mm. or you make the enemies harder and then every spider slash bandit slash wolf you encounter it's a fight it's a serious fight and none of this really makes sense i don't know if have you played war tales by any chance the I don't think so, no. That was Actually, I haven't played like almost anything in two years. I just bring it up because it'll let you put, you could have like 20 people in your party, basically. And <laughs> most of the reviews, and I'd have to agree, it just doesn't, it kind of just drags things out to have such a big party. It sounds fun at first. Like, oh, I'd love to have this huge party. Uh, but yeah, between waiting, you know, all those turns and, you know, the, the, of course, they have to have more monsters yeah. in there. It just doesn't really... It's not as fun. As you and, any, anything you encounter becomes like this epic battle. Yeah. And what we didn't want to have is like all epic battles. What we wanted to do was to make it tactical without dragging. Yeah. So four is the sweet spot for us. Sure. I had a bug that was my doing <laughs> where the... The fifth wouldn't leave the party under certain circumstances. It was a trigger that didn't trigger on all situations. And everybody was like, I'm not, I haven't switched the party around for like the last 10 hours. I have five. And I was like, oh God, that wasn't <laughs> the point. No. How do I tell them? And of course, I, I delayed fixing that bug for three patches. Just so I would let them enjoy that. Okay, okay, it's a bug. Enjoy it. But eventually I had to fix that that one. I'm trying to think. I think Might and Magic 6, one of my favorites. I want to say that has four. You occasionally pick up an extra one, if I recall correctly. Baldur's Gate. I have, I, Baldur's Gate has more, I think. I, I don't know, but think... a lot of games seem to have four. It seems... uh, yeah. It's a sweet spot, and you know we it's rely on. It's, it's not overwhelming, you know. It's enough to where you feel like you've got some choices. And we had a few decisions where, honestly, we just relied on on acquired wisdom. Like it was like, look, let's let's look at how the other guys do it, yeah. and it, it probably makes sense. This one wasn't one of those. This one. As I told you, it was a weird uh, path to getting there. But there's a lot of things where you don't really have to reinvent the wheel. Like, it doesn't make sense. And you're going to probably try 50 different combinations and then be like, mm, you know, these guys really were smart because they did it like that. So, yeah, there's kind of a balance you have to strike, I think, with something like that. Because you want the somebody that plays a lot of games like this, a lot of CRPGs, right? You, you don't want them to play your game and be like, I don't know how to, what I'm doing. This is totally weird. I mean, <laughs> so somewhere between that and like, oh, this is exactly like, you know. This other, is exactly you like. You want to have enough. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying, right? It's, it's got to be different enough. <laughs> but not... It, it uh, yeah, and a lot, a lot of uh, you know, the, there's the common question: Why is your game special, and why should I play this and not that? And I always approached that with the way I approach reading a book. Uh, I, I I have never seen, I have never heard anyone say, "Look, 
uh, what is your book? It's a science fiction. Yeah, but I already read the Simov. Why would I read this one? Well, it's another thing. It it doesn't have to reinvent the the way. It's not the same. It's the same genre. It's it relies on the same basics, but it's a different story. It's a different idea. So it's not. I I all I. As much as I run away from, you know, this copycat, let's make something like that. I also run away from originality at all costs. Let's let's make something like... Com- Does it make sense? No, it makes sense for this specific system. 50 other games used it. And it kind of works correctly like that. Let's stick with that. And uh, y- you want to make your own game. And you want to make your own game, and your own game, it's um, like, uh, 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 let's put it like this. What if we did something like Medieval XCOM? Uh, As a base, base concept. But let's leave out the very tedious parts of it, and let's keep the the base management stuff and let's go with the crpg feeling but still keep those elements that i like there and you know it goes on and on and on and then you get to what zoria is today i mean i think that's absolutely the right approach you know i've been thinking about you know, sometimes I, I talk to especially writers, it seems, <laughs> and they seem to have this obsession with, like you say, originality, and they want to do something weird and creative and all this stuff. And maybe it's maybe it's cool, but you know, part of me is just like, yeah, but I would just as soon be fighting uh, orcs and <laughs> give me an elf and a dwarf. You know, you know, I don't necessarily need this this radically different. Uh, you know, I think I. Like, ha- <laughs> like, the, like the steampunk and stuff it's cool but you know i wouldn't want to just play only that i have this grounding th- idea in designing this i mean there's a lot of like really fun games but you look at it and you're like would you live in a world like that would you understand it let's let's have 90 per- 80 90 percent of things we understand Mm-hmm. So you you ground yourself in a world you understand, and then we add our special sauce to it. If you want to make like a fancy new burger, you don't replace the buns and the meat and the sauce and the veg and everything because it's not a burger anymore. It, it nobody understands what it is. It's like, yeah, we're going to make this fantasy game. It's not going to have any magic. It's not going to have any elves. It's not going to be any... <laughs> yeah. like, well, it's not even a fantasy anymore. What, what exactly. <laughs> That's the idea. So, yeah, it's a balance. Let's stick with a lot of things we know and then add our our little sauce and maybe our special uh, flavor to it. Yeah, maybe we can get more into that, that special flavor because I do have this, this question about the world building. We already kind of touched on it. Do you have a snappy way to describe your special sauce for making a really compelling game world? A lot of people watch this show probably. (laughs) I don't know what the percentages are, but I know they probably at least thought about making their own game at some point or at least their own uh, story or setting. So what what kind of advice would you give somebody that was trying Uh, to make an interesting fantasy world? I'm going to give half an advice. Why half? Because this was me and Stefan... Uh, going back and forth, back and forth. So there were two creators into this. I'm going to tell you my part. It's like this for me. Um, We had the story before we made the first, very first scene, the story. The very, very general outline of the story we had. So we knew where we started, where we wanted to go. We knew that we wanted the an apparent conflict and a deeper conflict between beneath it. We had the, you know, classic medieval conflict, good versus bad, but then you have the deeper humanity versus like 
very old humanity gone wrong um, conflict and everything. So we had the general idea in place. Um, and then, as I said, one of the main pillars I had was because uh, I was and I'm I I'm trying somehow not to because they're like really good games. I just didn't like them myself. There were some games in that time that were like really good, but very, you know, dark, grim. But, and I was like, because in the end, you're trying to save the world, right? And I was looking at that one of those games and I was like, but why would I want to save that world? I mean, seriously, you're, you're tasking me with it, saving it, but look at it. I don't want to live there, regardless of how it looks. So one of my main pillars was make it a place that's livable, that's li alive, that's you you get to an inn and you have people and they're drinking and they're happy and they're dancing and they're and you have their own little stories in the world. Make it livable, make it a place worth saving, make it um uh, and make it real. I, I uh and there's I, I wrote a lot of lore in the game. And even if it's um like magic and techno magic, because it's like this, I, I, I don't really know where you are in the story, so I, I'm trying to like discuss it and don't spoil it too much and all that. But you have this like super technological laboratory in the beginning of the game so you get an idea and sorry I've, I've seen that yeah yeah so uh you get this magic uh and techno but i try to explain everything everything i i wanted to make sense not just ah we have a teleport here why because we need one Th there's gotta be a, why is it there how did it end up um what helped me uh, with this is I, I um, studied architecture, so I have a lot of ideas of uh, the old civilizations and how they uh, worked and how history went over them and how, you know, there's a lot of monuments that we visit today that like 200 years ago were like this much out of the out of the sand or out of the the, the earth. So would this be make sense be buried for 2000 years yeah it would look at egypt and then would this thing make sense be here everybody see it nobody ask why is this weird thing here and stay here for a thousand years actually yeah it would make sense because it happened to like a lot of the the, the things we have we have uh, today then they were like as i said a stone or something and nobody bothered to dig them up for 2000 years or would it make sense to have a whole city hidden behind yeah there's one in turkey they uncovered it like 100 years ago and they figured out there's a whole city and everybody forgot about it so i try to to make a connection to what i know of the the, the world and think would this make sense would would it is it like makes no what i hate is i look at something like, this makes no sense like absolutely no sense like somehow palpatine return makes no sense like you know makes no sense let's let's give it a an explanation that's the whole thing you you, you have to have a a connection an explanation um a feedback on that Man, I like I, I really like what you're saying there. I've been I've got a couple of different things floating around in my head, <laughs> but you know, I just was thinking I like to read the ancient Greeks, you know, stuff like Herodotus, and you know, it's always fun when you see them talking about like ancient ruins and things, and you're like, wow, this is somebody that's like their civilization is in ruins, and they, they, there's like ruins that they're seeing. <laughs> like, how far does that yeah, go back? Yeah. And, and we probably don't even know. I feel like we don't know anything. <laughs> we made like one percent. <laughs> No, but I was also the, thinking about what you said that really struck a chord with me was making a, a game world that people want to live in. You know, I've always uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, fans of J.R.R. Tolkien. You know, and everybody says 
I would love to live in Middle Earth. You know, I, I would love to go there. <laughs> like that's a good game world or, or a good, uh, you know, world, a w good world building. Uh, whereas, yeah, a lot of these other games, they they're, they always go for like the dark and, you know, the dark, gritty. And like, oh, why would you want to go there? <laughs> and why would I want to save it? Maybe go clean uh, it up or something. I, I don't know what the, yeah. the gist is, but yeah, I think we know. I'm not sure exactly what game you have in mind, but <laughs> yeah, I know. I think it's, again, coming back to sometimes a writer just wants to be able to say, I did something radically different in my my game, and maybe it doesn't always. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I applaud them for the bravery. <laughs> you know, I, I go, go do it. You know, that's your, your vision. Uh, but just, you know, I want to go some, <laughs> you know, like there's so many games that I've played that are set in like a snowy snowy waste you know it's like nothing but snow and cold and ice everywhere and i'm like i live i live in minnesota this is this is my life for you know nine months out of the year i don't want to see the same thing in a game i, I i'm not a big fan of cold honestly so no i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't do that but generally yes and look this is one place where i honestly would say what games like world of warcraft have a had an impact because sure there were the dark greedy areas but yeah. then you would go to like a foresty colorful fresh looking place where you would feel wonderful for the entire five minutes be to, before a rogue killed you but that's another story <laughs> but you would feel good you know it, it, it even feels good when the rogue kills you and it's not like old snow and so yeah it's a i want to feel good about that world you know something else too about your game that really uh, i was trying to find a picture of it i couldn't unfortunately but the, there's a map that you can see you know like the world map <laughs> the, know, the big I, map i yeah. love looking at that because it kind of makes you look at it like oh i wonder what what it's like over there <laughs> You know, I wonder what this little piece over here is like. You know, like You're, make you want to explore. Yeah, you really touch the chord. That is one of the systems that never made it into Zoria One. Hopefully, there will be a Zoria Two, and we. I actually, there's another map. That's the regions map. It's mm -hmm. not in the game, but it is there. We have it. So the idea was that you would conquer each of those regions it was more of a mini game than necessarily a, oh, but it would a regional map then <laughs> that's a world map i meant but what what happens when you hit the map button that thing makes me want to explore yeah but there's also the big map you know the one in in the keep where you you oh, see the yeah. whole map and that one had a regions map on it and there was another level of um getting in contact with the whole continent and figuring out oh, okay. you know because each air region had its peculiarities because actually they're thought out each region has has its own thing is it uh, because i i wrote a bit of back history about all of these areas and the old empires and i thought about okay so this has been part of that empire like 2000 years ago so it would be more like this because look what happens with the outer parts of the roman empire and if you go to like northern northern africa or uh, the eastern mediterranean you're gonna see some like fascinating roman temples that are bigger than anything in europe just because some things happen and so I tried to put that, but yeah, the map system didn't really, uh, didn't really make it into the game in the end because it was a, another layer of complexity. Well, we're about an hour and a half into this. You got time for a couple more questions? I, I honestly, I, I, I think it's clear. I'm pretty talkative guy, so I have all the time in, in the world. I'm I always right, I like couple, doing yeah, this. I definitely got a couple that I think we should we should hit. I got one from Miko here. Uh, what are the three biggest challenges in making an indie RPG these days? Uh the biggest the biggest challenges. 
the biggest challenge it's one that attracts all the others it's scale like the sh sheer size of it if you want to make it like a proper rpg sure there's a lot of smaller rpgs that rely on uh like a smaller subset of systems or something like that but if you want to make it like a proper rpg like they used to feel it's just scale because again you can't have a proper rpg without side quests or without uh, interesting characters or without uh, like a hundred different kind of monsters or like rats three or like 10 classes and eight uh pieces eight if i'm correct pieces of armor for mm. each and uh so you get you you quickly get to like two thousand pieces of armor or something like that to design and to create and uh you get to like 250 to 300 thousand words because you need lore and you need dialogues and you and everything is just a matter of scale and at some point we had like because I'm, I think the whole game has something like 60 different scenes. And at some point, because I, I told the guys, look, the problem is this. If we made a mistake that takes one day to correct per scene, we need two months to fix it. It's just scale, which is in, insane. The, the smaller the team, the, the, the more difficult it is to control. And that with that come all the other challenges like okay you need 2000 pieces of armor this is going to cost you have uh 250000 words and you have to localize them because people want them in french and in uh portuguese and and they're like this is going to cost and you want voiceovers and you still have 250. Okay, let's say a bit of it is lore. You have, you have 150,000 words that you want voiceover. This is going to cost. So the the costs uh, scale up with... And you have to find a way to make it happen without the kind of budgets like, you know, an established studio has so there's you have to be very creative in so it's just scale management um and in the end it's keeping yourself real to what you want to do because there's all kinds of shortcuts you can take there's the good ones and there's the bad ones and we talked about the bad ones early on the busy work, the let's make a quest that makes no sense that it's going to take you two hours to complete just because. Um, so there's, uh, you have to try and not over, you know, because there's always the in, this inflation of let's do this and let's do that and let's do this. And then in the end, you have to, you're trying to bite more than you, you can choose. So striking that balance it can get a bit hard. Yeah, I think there's so many people they start off thinking my, my first game is going to be an RPG. No. <laughs> Maybe they this should is... pick something a little bit smaller. <laughs> you know what our first game was? Our first game was a platformer. Sure, mm -hmm. it wasn't like super successful. It wasn't even necessarily like a super game I, I really hate looking at it now with what I learned in these years but honestly it taught us how to make them and it taught us how to publish them and the no don't go RPGs like a proper sized and scoped RPG it's probably one of the most complex games you can make besides like multiplayer games just in terms of items and i i think we have like a hundred or more excel sheets with different things uh, abilities armors um um like you said herbs and um meats and um e ability effects and who gets what and how does 
uh, each and every little system work and like if you you don't really get the scale of it until you start making it because there's a lot of questions you you haven't answered because you don't know you're going to be asking yourself those questions so you start you make and that's somebody okay but what happens if i do this or what happens if the player wants to do that mm. and the answer to that question it's two months of work that you did not account for and you multiply that for like 50 systems you have in the game and you're in development hell. So you have to understand the sheer size of the complexity of what you're doing. We're lucky because we did project management, two of us independently of, uh, because me and Stefan are very old friends and we we did this and we, we could barely keep this beast under control, like narrowly keep it under control and we still had bugs and we still had things we we didn't think of because when you have like we have a hundred and probably 70 quests all in all which all the quests you know and all the invisible quests that keep the game working there's uh like thousands of possible combinations of what the player can do and you didn't think of complexity it's gonna be like insanely b b hard to keep under control that would be my advice don't don't go there try try something smaller or even try an rpg but try it with one map see what happens answer the questions before you have to answer them for 50 maps yeah i've heard some developers say that you should try making a mod, like a module for something like yeah. Neverwinter Nights first. And if you can make it all the way through that and actually make a decent game, you know, maybe you could take the knowledge. <laughs> I I I'm I honestly I don't agree with that. Uh oh. because the problem with making a mod, it's there are a thousand questions the game developer has answered for you. Mm. How should the UI look? What should happen when I click this? Where should I put the buffs and debuffs? Does it make sense if the buffs don't are not visible when I do that? Uh, what? How? How this uh, um, crafting system interacts with um, I don't know resting or any? All of these questions have been answered. You're just doing level design mm. it's a it's something good to to uh get your experience to make your first experience but it's not a game because the the sheer amount of very small stupid questions that you have to answer that have nothing to do with gameplay nothing to do with but if you answer them wrong people are gonna be very annoyed because mm. It, you're gonna make their experience miserable because when they press on map they don't see which we did and we fixed after release if they hover over the dungeons on the map they don't see what classes they need for the various um uh class specific areas and honestly i didn't think of that and they were like Look, this is really simple. It took me 30 minutes to fix. But it's a UI thing. A mod, it's... If you get to do a mod, the developers already fixed that. You mm -hmm. don't see it. You take it as... Oh, it's, it's natural for it to be here. No, it's not. Like, uh, there's a million things that... Oh. It's really not natural for them to be there. You just, if you feel it's natural for them to be there, it's because the guys did it right. And if they, they do it wrong, you're going to know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's an experience. But no, uh, it's the stupid questions that take the long, longest time. No, I was, I took a, spent one summer trying to make a game. And I was started to notice that when I was working on the UI, 
and I was looking for things like I want a little sound to play, like when you do drag an item over or something. And then like that seems like a simple thing, but then I downloaded like the sound library. <laughs> it's like okay, now I got like a thousand sound effects. <laughs> I need to go through each one and try to find just the perfect thing. You know, another thing that really I couldn't believe how hard it was. Uh, I wanted to split items, you know, let's say you've got like 40 herbs, you should be able to split that into two stacks and then Oh my God! You know, you just—I just totally took that for granted. <laughs> Other games and somebody really—it it takes a long time. And beyond the technical part, we had and actually it happened with the sounds. You know, when you you when you activate the vision and you see all the items, there was a sound. There's a whoosh, mm -hmm. and then there everybody was like, "Can you mute that?" Because it sounds awesome the first 10 times, but I do it like a hundred times an hour and three hours in, all I hear is whoosh, 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 whoosh. And then we put the, the option to mute that specific sound. So yeah, it's weird. I always think about that line, you must gather your party before venturing forth. <laughs> like not a, it muted, I've heard of all right, if I got time for a, well, this is a, this kind of leads in to what we're talking about. So you want to do a last question here? Uh, as I said, as many as you want. I I'm, I I do, like talking about let's this. Do this one because I think it kind of ties into what we were talking about with just the the feature creep, basically. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about AI. It seems like all anybody wants to talk about. Uh, <laughs> there seems to be a lot of controversy around it. You know, how do you, what, how do you see it? Do you see this as a powerful tool or is it uh, something to it's, be avoided? Or? It's, it's a tool like a knife. It's wonderful for cutting steak. It can do a lot of uglier and bad things if used improperly. It's a tool. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, AI, it's exactly a tool. It, you know, it's like dynamite. It's absolutely like dynamite. It can push you forward or it can destroy you. But it's a tool if you want to. I, I experimented with it a bit. I'm honestly, I'm not really that good at it. I mean, I'm really bad at it. it either I'm bad or the AI it's, has something with me, but I'm sticking with I'm bad with it. Because uh, I never seem to get the like the awesome results everybody else is getting. But if you want the AI to help you, but you have a good idea of what you want to do, it could prob it should probably be a a really good helper for like a single developer that it can't really be everything and doesn't have the time and the power to be everything. At the same time, if you want the AI to help get a, give you a good idea for a story or to make a really nice character for you because you're not really sure what you want to do, then it's not so good. It, it, it and I'm sure because I I know humanity and it's it's got its bad sides. We're gonna see a lot of the bad use of AI because before we're gonna see like the correct use of AI. The AI it's um, in a way, AI, it's uh, me searching on Google on steroids mm -hmm. because that's what it is in the end. It, it gathers existing knowledge. You can do that on right now with your search engine. You can look like uh, find a hundred nice images and try to, to piece together one that kind of looks like that. You can do the same with text. You don't really need ai just does it faster and it appears to do it smoother honestly i i i don't buy all the hype i don't think it's where people that want to sell it say it is but what i'm afraid is that the little guy that could actually and the little studios and the 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 small the starting developers that can could really benefit from it, are not going to benefit from it. But what's going to happen, it's, you know, the big studios are going to end up, the corp, the suits in the big studios are going to go like, oh, wonderful, we don't need like 20 graphic designers anymore. We can do 
do it with two before you actually have actual proof that you can do it with two. And in five years' time, we get 20 games that look the same or 20 games with text that sounds the same. Um, kind of like what, what what happened with Unreal Engine at some point where everybody discovered what it could do graphically and then we had like a lot of games that kind of looked the same because everybody was using the same new systems and you know th- this happens with every new tool like in the 70s when everybody discovered plastic furniture and it was like wow and then everything was plastic until they figured out okay plastic it's it's really fun and we can do a lot of things with it but not everything has to be plastic that's going to ha- i believe it's going to happen with ai we're going to go in that place where everything is going to be the text is going to be AI. The, 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 the video is going to be AI. It's going to feel the same. And then people are going to tone it down and figure out what works and what doesn't. That's my my feel on it. On I think you're right. And you know, like coming back to our example with the 2,000 items and they all need descriptions or some sort. I could imagine somebody thinking, oh, I could just have you know AI write those for me. It might sound good in theory. <laughs> but, no, but, it know, is once good. You get used to seeing the same, you know, things over in every game. You're gonna be, oh no, I I need some. Yeah, author's yeah. Touch. That, <laughs> that's the problem. It's gonna be good on the first game. In mm. the next fifty games, it's gonna feel the same. <laughs> well, this has been great stuff, and thanks for talking. We learned a lot. Great here. pleasure. I'm always, uh, always a pleasure to talk about. Zoria, so of course. Like you're, it's... Working on, uh, you're still working on patches and things. Do you have plans for a, a, the next big project? Or... <sighs> Not yet. Um, the um, Right now, we're still looking where to go. Maybe DLC, maybe... Uh, because there's still a lot of Zoria left to tell, you know, but... but if we were be we if we would have been left to our own devices there would be still zoria in development for another two years so we had to to stop at some point so yeah we could go that route and there's a lot of things we could do or we could go zoria too but i don't know right now um the short term it's trying to remember how actual normal humans function on a normal schedule because we like kind of forgot how that works um and crunch. yeah it, it it's crunch it's more like a way of life uh, when because it's your baby you know it's not crunch it's you you sit idle and you're like but i could be making my game better in this time so i should be making my game better right so you you end up doing it continuously so i no immediate plans but yeah we're still working on some patches um i I just right now before we entered this i i looked into our discord and there were like four new tasks that gabi the programmer put in for Gabi to fix because they're programming issues, but he found them on forums and he put them there so he can fix them. So we're still uh, because we're 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 trying to make the game, you know, as good as it is. Have it up like a, a product without bugs, if that's possible. And we still have to add controller support. We we kind of left that one. It's an RPG. It's not really. Yeah. Uh, controllers yeah 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 uh, and it's quite requi- requested like, uh. and yeah, get- with steam deck now steam deck it's like a whole there's different a universe demand. there's a lot of demand for controllers but... yeah <laughs> yeah well, yeah i i, I, I you, i'm <laughs> just as surprised I, I i couldn't but okay no problem no, the, the, you're not going to go the AI, or not the AI, the uh, VR, the uh, Apple Vision Pro, or anything. <laughs> That's sort of, what do they call that? Uh, uh, it's not virtual reality. 
Augmented uh, reality. Augmented kind of... reality. Uh, honestly, I I really believed in augmented reality at some point. But if Valve couldn't make it happen with Half-Life, nobody's going to make it happen. I mean, really, when, when Valve came up and said, look, we're going to make Half-Life for VR. Let's see if that sells VR. And that didn't sell VR. I don't think there's anything on this world that could sell VR if they didn't do it with that. That's a good point. Yeah, they got some friends that are really great. They really are excited about the Apple Vision Pro. And I'm still a little skeptical. I'm I'm sort of on the fence about it. You know, it always seems every time I hear about it, it seems like, wow, this could be this great thing, but something's just not there yet. No, it's not there yet. I, I'd love to see it. Honestly, I, I was a big Star Trek fan when I was a kid. And yeah. Um and I'm living like a an awesome times when a lot of the things we've been dreaming about as kids. We're playing with them now. So honestly, it's an awesome time to be alive with all the caveats and all the, you know, quirks because nothing it says it was in the movies, but it's an awesome time to be alive for somebody that grew up on the science fiction of the 80s and the 90s. And to be here now, extraordinary. I'd love to see actual functional augmented reality. That would be like, the the possibilities would be endless and i'm a creator i i i'd love to get my hands on that and and make some really fun stuff with it but it's just not there yet it, not yet i don't know maybe at some point but we we stayed we 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 had this pandemic and uh, after two years what we needed was human contact what we wanted was human contact so i don't think we're really there yet prepared to um get all our human contact through a digital layer i don't think we're there yet as a society you know, I don't know. I've been, I've been really trying to think about this Vision Pro, like what it could do, what would be the, like the killer app for it. And I haven't, I've just kind of been stumped with it. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff I've seen. You know, I do think, though, think, I was thinking about Star Trek 2 and how the, uh, you know, they had the communicators <laughs> and like the little iPads basically in that. And, you know, I remember watching that show as a kid thinking, oh, I'd love to have one of those. <laughs> now we have it, you know. And so now we have it. We almost take it for granted now. Like, you know how awesome it would have been to me in high school to have this little, uh, you know, iPhone thing that I could watch movies on and play games on. I mean, <laughs> and, <laughs> it would have been mind-blowing. We don't understand the sheer immensity of the power we have you yeah. have basically whatever your mind at this point could think of you can you in 30 seconds you can search it and find out everything humanity has been able to conjure about it in 30 seconds you yeah, have like you know i imagine sitting in a classroom right I do these seminars in college and you know if i had this vision pro thing on so like the professor could be lecturing and this thing could be giving me like synopses and, uh, you know, the corner of my eye could be reading uh, about some of the references and like, can you, you know, maybe it could sense like you seem to be confused, Matt, <laughs> you know, here, here, let me give you a, you know, another way to, to put, I mean, I, I can see applications like that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, That's and be, I, yeah. What worries me is that we're going to get AR TikTok because before AR TikTok. Wait, and yeah, and uh, uh, b before we're going to be willing to read those, we're going to be in the five seconds uh, uh, oh, next. So... Yeah. <laughs> uh, somehow we tend to do that, you know, we, we have this like awesome thing and then we find the like the weirdest application for it possible. And as I said, we have this in insane power in our hands. And we found the perfect way to numb us down. Scrolling, 
So, yeah, uh, I think I think right now we have a little bit more technology than we really know how to handle. And I'm saying that that uh, as I said, I dreamt about all having all this. Yeah, some you ever watch those mate the Matrix that movie? I always think. If they ever come to me and like you, all you gotta do is get in this little coffin thing, man. It'll be awesome. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not getting in that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, we should we should end our conversation on such a dark note, though. Yeah, go, go ahead. No, <laughs> no, no. A brighter. It, 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 a brighter it, uh, you got a it, it's a problem over there, huh? <laughs> it's it's a bright note. Okay. We have. Uh, it is a bright note. We have like technical issues with the things that we have dreamt about and are now real yeah it's technical issues but we're there and we can play with them yeah sure maybe ar vr it's not there yet as a game developer i hope i get to play with them and make fun cool stuff with them before that i hope i get to play zoria too because that means i have i get to make zoria too so we're we'll see uh i i first of all i hope people like zoria as it is enough to come and say guys you should make two well i think you've got lots of uh lots of praise and awards and mm. It, and just a couple. I wouldn't get too negative about these reviews. I mean, I just want to have always look happy at this, gamers. Like, how many I'm, hours do they do they spend on the game? Right? If, the, if somebody's played this game for a hundred hours, I'd say that's a good game. You know, I don't care what. Yeah, the fact they spend hundred hours. Nobody spends a hundred hours. <laughs> I don't care what you say. You don't spend a hundred hours playing a game you hate. Yeah, that's my that's my thought too. But again, that's I, what 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 internet has taught me is that there's like a billion kinds of different people, and it's okay. It's it's good to be like that. Well, Stefan, I think that's a good stopping point. <laughs> this has been really fun talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. It I, I I really enjoyed it, and yeah, I I I like doing this. Honestly, I I like talking about games, and I like talking about Zoria. So I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna now? Now is the fun part. Now. We we finish the hard work. Now we get to talk about it. Now is the fun part. Bask in the the glory. Bask in the glory. Ah. Uh, Bask. <laughs> but no honestly yeah it's 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 good that we got here it's good that we we got it out in the wild it's good that people are enjoying it um that's what you want to see when you work on a game you want to see people enjoying it well will you come back on when it's zoria two time oh with great pleasure with absolutely <laughs> with great pleasure but uh we're a few years from that with yeah we'll see if it if it happens when it happens as i said it's a it's a really hard process and even from the business side it's a really complex process to 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 get to making the game so yeah, we're not there yet, but hopefully we that what you want to make do as a game developer, you know, you want success, you want money. You, you honestly, you want to make the next game. You want to be able to make the next game. That's the core success of a game developer. Good way to put it. So yeah, I I really hope we meet again for Zoria too. Yeah, we will. That got a good that means we did well. I got I got a feeling you'll be back on. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Thank you, thank you for yeah. the the opportunity. Thank you for taking your time with the, with us. Um, I discovered the show 
recently-ish, but I've been having like a lot of fun since I did. So I'm really happy I'm I'm uh, I'm here. I hope hopefully I'll still be around. <laughs> you know, don't oh. wait too long. <laughs> but I, yeah, we're, we're, gonna... we're not the youngest ourselves. Well, you're doing the hard work. I'm just making videos and talking to people. <laughs> it's, making, hard making it's hard game. work. It's hard work. What? <laughs> It's hard work. It's a work in itself, and it's a it's a hard work. Actually, I I've seen it from the the other side, and it's hard work. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, I got some really fun stuff in the pipe. Uh, you are really going to want to stay tuned. Got a big surprise coming up in a couple of weeks. But uh, next time I'll be talking to Jess Morissette. Uh, so if you want to check him out, give me any questions, topics, suggestions. Love to hear from you. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Thank you very, very much for making uh, this and all episodes of Mad Chat possible. I would not and could not do it without you and your support. So thank you so much for that. You know, I realize that the uh, uh, game development, the game industry world has been hemorrhaging people it's just kind of a horrible situation a lot of people uh, out of work getting laid off uh, so if that is uh, you you know I've, you have my sympathy <laughs> so don't worry about supporting match yet focus on supporting yourself obviously uh, but if you are in a position with a few extra bucks and you like the show uh, please uh, kick over there to that patreon site in the show notes buck a show two bucks a show maybe you could do five bucks a show uh, whatever it is uh, that you could afford and that feels right for you, please just go to the link in the show notes to the Patreon page and become a member. You'll really like it. We've got a great Discord channel and lots of other fun stuff uh, that we get up to. Uh, but mostly, thank you for keeping the show alive. Uh, okay, let's see. What about that news from Night Cave? <laughs> Oh, I got lots of news. Got four, four items, <laughs> um, and three are from Miko, and the fabulous Miko reporter, Matt Chat extraordinaire. All right, first off, there's a game called Marathon. Uh, you might have heard of that, a uh, bungee uh, first-person shooter uh, from 1994. Uh, well, now you can get it for free on Steam. Uh, this classic 90, 1994 Bungie first-person shooter had a foundational influence on the genre and now maintained by the fan community. Uh, so check that out. They got some updates to it. Optional widescreen HUD support, 3D filtering, positional audio, and 60-plus frames per second interpolation, just in case the original is too authentic, they say. All right, it looks pretty cool. Uh, next up, Sword Haven Iron Conspiracy. Uh, you know, I've been talking about this off and on the past few episodes. I supported the uh, Kickstarter project, and it looks like it has been successful. Now, if you're not familiar with this, uh, for whatever reason, it is uh, uh, from the Atom, or Atom Team, A-T-O-M. Uh, they have hit three stretch goals with this, player base. So you get a player base now, a cursed city and festivals and holidays. Explore the land of Nova Draconia. Discover mysterious artifacts and unravel a conspiracy that threatens the existence of the world. So really looking forward to that. That is, once again, a sword haven, iron conspiracy. So thank you uh, and uh, congratulations <laughs> to the team. You know, they must be uh, celebrating. Uh, and then the third item from Miko, there's a game called Crypt Master. Now this thing just looks flat out bizarre. Kind of reminds me of a Ghost, <laughs> if, you, if you know that band, and you probably do. Uh, well, this is a word-based, W-O-R-D, word-based dungeon crawler. Say anything you want. Interact with the world and conquer quests by typing or speaking any word you can think of. Each encounter has multiple solutions to discover. A weird, wild world. <laughs> yes, it is. Travel through underground kingdoms and meet talking doors, flirtatious toads. Flirtatious toads, okay. <laughs> Sarcastic ghouls and much more. Use your words. I've got to say, this thing just looks flat out bizarre. Uh, I might have to check it out uh, for a match head. You know, maybe 
I'm, I'm guessing the developers behind this would be pretty interesting to talk to. Anyway, you can pick it up for $22.24 on GOG. It's 10% off. You know, I buy, uh, by the way, I should mention you can get Zoria uh, from Steam right now or GOG. It's 20% off uh, or $19.99. All right. And then I've got one last item here from Indica Scarlet. Uh, so this is a Corsair. Uh, they make a lot of accessories, of course, joysticks and, and mice and keyboards and things. I'm, yeah, I've got a Corsair keyboard over there. Love it. Uh, well, they are going all in on sim racing. Uh, they are going to acquire a company called Fana, Fanatic, <laughs> Fanatec, however you say that, F-A-N-A-T-E-C, uh, and help with its 70 million euro debt. And apparently sim racers are quite excited about this. Uh, and they make a little note here in this article that sim racers are among the most enthusiastic of all gamers, often spending thousands of dollars on equipment on top of thousands more on PCs and monitors. And I don't know if that's just for racing games or does that also include the uh, uh, flight simulator folks? You know, I've seen some pretty elaborate setups for that. Uh, but anyway, pretty interesting little tidbit there. Uh, so check that out. All right. What about the ale of the week? Well, I'm, uh, I was at Sam's Club. <laughs> uh, they got a little liquor store uh, attached to the clubs. And apparently you don't even need a membership to uh, purchase brews from there. Uh, but I was uh, curious to see if the non-alcoholic uh, fad or uh, what a trend, I guess, has, has caught on to the point where you can buy uh, selections from Sam's Club. Well, not. They don't have a huge selection. Matter of fact, only one. <laughs> it was uh, the Heineken. Uh, so this is the Heineken 0.0. I guess that's what it's called. Yeah, just Heineken 0.0 .0 brewed in Holland. You can get these in a 12-pack. Serve at 35 degrees uh, or 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Water, malted barley, hop extract, and natural flavor. Not seeing a whole lot of uh, information about this. Of course, you know a Heineken's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good brew, fairly widely available. Uh, so let's see what they, uh, how their zero alcohol version <laughs> holds up. Uh, so let me pour some here in the. Well, let me pour some in the glass first, and we'll try the drinking horn. It's kind of a skinny little can. You know, I wonder if they're trying to appeal to like the diet, <laughs> nutrition, and fitness crowd. Well, if it's a skinny can, it can't be fattening, right? Is that how the logic works on that? All right, pouring some in the glass there. Let me uh, show this to you. A little bit of a golden color, kind of a light color. You know, I wish I had a regular Heineken here just so you can uh, see it side by side. Really active carbonation on that. It's just, I really love to see that. Just thousands and thousands of little bubbles there. Just a beautiful sight. Good head, good good foam on that. You know, it smells to me just like a regular Heineken, which is a pretty good smell. A little bit hoppy. Uh, you could definitely smell the barley in this. You know, certain beers I like to call my uh, lawnmower beers or <laughs> mowing the grass beers. You know, it's a hot summer day. You're out mowing the grass. You're drenched in sweat. <laughs> uh, you need something refreshing. And for some reason, these uh, uh, the beers with the more of a barley uh, Pilsner kind of style always works better for me. Uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm really hot and sweaty, the last thing I want is some bitter, dark, uh, syrupy beer. You want something light and refreshing. And, you know, the good thing about the non-alcoholic beers is you don't have to worry about dehydrating yourself. You're actually hydrating while you're enjoying a beer. You know, I don't know how you can go wrong <laughs> with that combination. All right, pouring that in there. You know, I have noticed the non-alcoholics are getting a little more popular in the restaurants, too. The last couple of places I've been, uh, they've had at least a couple of options. Now, they're still in the bottles and cans. You know, I'd like, to, like it even better if they could uh, serve these on a tap. Uh, so that's what I'm waiting on. But for now, we have bottles and cans. <laughs> All right, let's try it. Wow, you know, I'm just really just flabbergasted as how far these non-alcoholic beers have come and so soon. You know, you remember when I first started this little series, 
every beer was like watery and you're like oh man who would rather you know i might drink this <laughs> if there was nothing else available but who would choose this you know unless you had uh, concerns about alcohol you know why would you choose a, one of these uh, really watery uh, beers over uh, the real thing uh, but you know this heineken zero is a good example of i couldn't even tell the difference <laughs> if you give me a heineken and a heineken zero and said choose figure out which one has zero alcohol you know, I couldn't do it. I mean, it's just that close. I mean, they have whatever the science is here, if they've knocked it out of the park. Just, you know, really good. I like the, uh, you can really taste that carbonation. To, you know, the mouthfeel, it smells like a beer. It tastes like a beer. It feels like a beer. You know, there's absolutely no reason to, you would not in any way be disappointed with this. <laughs> it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta drink the zero. No, no, it's, it's just as good. I don't think you could tell a difference. I know not everybody's a big fan of the Heinekens. You know, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, beers out there I'd probably rather drink, but uh, again, there's a certain time and a place where something like this just hits the spot. And wow, that look at that fermentation on. I mean, the uh, carbonation rather. Hmm. You know, this is just damn good. <laughs> just, wow. A really solid non-alcoholic choice. You know, I, I, I think you just uh, couldn't go wrong with this, you know, especially if you are, again, uh, looking for something uh, in that Pilsner barley, kind of a cereal uh, taste. You know, these, uh, these kind of beers and Budweiser's and drinks like that, they always uh, kind of remind me a little bit of Frosted Flakes or Corn Flakes. Uh, so, you know, some people, since these are so popular and common, uh, they think they don't like beer, <laughs> but, but it's just because they've only tried those. So if it works for you, uh, great, but just, you know, keep in mind, uh, this is a very kind of uh, special taste and you can, there's a huge variety of, uh, of ales out there that taste completely different. Uh, but anyway, I really like that. You know, I feel pretty comfortable. If we're just talking about non-alcoholics, I'll go five out of five on this. I mean, just... They've nailed it. It tastes just the same. <laughs> uh, comparing it to all beers, you know, I'd still probably go pretty high. Uh, you know, especially if you like that kind of Pilsner cereal uh, kind of flavor. You know, I might go uh, somewhere between three and a four uh, out of uh, five drinking horns on that. Um, you know, just because <laughs> if you're going to compare it to an Abbey Ale, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, but just as uh, uh, for what it is, you know, it's certainly very good. All right, uh, well, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I thought for fun, I thought I would read the quote to you and then see if you can guess who said this. <laughs> you know, it's pretty obvious if you think about it, but we'll see. And it goes something like this. It's actually a point. What do I know of cultured ways, the guilt, the craft, and the lie? I, who was born in a naked land and bred in the open sky, the subtle tongue, the sophist guile, they fail when the broadswords sing, rush in and die, dogs. I was a man before I was a king. Let you guess who said that? Yes, you are correct. It was Robert E. Howard. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. They will do everything possible to test us, but they will only test their own embarrassment. <laughs>